Well, we come to question 10 of the Catechism. You will remember that we asked uh, some time ago, um, how does God execute His decrees? And God executes His decrees in the works of creation and providence. So we spent some time last week looking at that, as well as looking at the work of creation. The question asked, what is the work of creation? The work of creation is God's making all things of nothing by the word of His power in the space of six days and all very good. Mankind is, is singled out within the work of creation for a very particular reason. It is not until man is created that God says of his creation that it is very good. And so while the question regarding creation in general says that all this was very good, that statement is not said of the created order until mankind is created. Theologians and scholars for years and years and years in the history and the life of the church have said that man was God's crowning achievement or God's crowning work on the created order. And indeed, mankind does have a very particular role within creation, so it is probably right that the creation of mankind in particular is singled out. So question number 10 asks, how did God create man? And the answer is, God created man in his own image, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. So we're just going to walk through the answer to that question this evening in the particular order in which these things are giving to, given to us. We will look at God created, creating man, male and female. We will look at God creating man in the image of God. We will look at God creating man and endowing him with knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And we will look at God creating man and giving him dominion over all the creatures. We're just taking the answer in its logical order. So when we come to this, this answer to this question of how did God create man, this is the first thing that we see. Uh, first of all, that God created man. It would do well, we would do well to pause for just a minute on that point to orient ourselves into proper thinking of us as creation and God as creator. We say that quite a bit, but it's necessary for us to continue to remind ourselves about it because of how quickly we forget it. We like to think of ourselves as creative beings. Some of us are creative with our hands. Some of us are creative with our minds and our ability to compose music or write music or paint or draw or whatever or plant a garden and grow things, whatever it might be. Some of us are very creative in how big of a smart aleck we can be and how quick our wit is, you know, not pointing any fingers. But at the end of the day, as creative as we might be, we are not creators in the truest sense of that term. We may be makers, we may make things, but nothing that we make, we can make out of nothing the way that God did. So when we come to the question of how did God create man, we need to just pause at the first phrase, God created man. And thus orient ourselves properly as creation to God as our creator. Acknowledging that because we are created by God, we are his creation and he is our creator. He is deserving and worthy of all worship, all glory, all honor, all praise, all service. All things that we have within ourselves to render to Him should indeed be rendered to Him because He created us. Now, God created man in some particular categories. First, God created man, male and female. The question uh, could be asked upon that statement that God created man, male and female, why? Why not just man? Why not just woman? Why male and female? Take three stabs at giving an answer to that. First, for the propagation of the human race. The command is given here in the Genesis 1 account. After man is created, he is told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So out the gate, there's a natural necessity for the propagation of the human race. First, to immediately obey the command to be fruitful and multiply. I don't think I need to get too much into the biology of why a man and a woman is necessary to propagate the human race from that perspective of being fruitful and multiply. Most of us in this room understand exactly what's going on there. This is necessity for man and woman to be in existence in order for this to take place. Now, the question could be asked, could God not have done it another way? Yeah, I suppose he could, but he did it this way. And so that's what we're going to roll with, because that's exactly what he did. But further than this, in the mandate, which we'll talk more about later, of man not only being fruitful and multiplying, but also having dominion, filling the earth, subduing it, having dominion over everything that is on the earth, very quickly we're faced with a reality of how many people it would take to necessitate this. Now I get it, we're 
pre-fall here in Genesis chapter 1, so maybe we have some uh, fantastical ideas that they had a grander capacity for work than we do. But I just don't simply think that is the case. Because work was given to mankind, mankind was created for a particular capacity to work. Therefore, the concept of just exactly how many animals and birds and fish and creeping things there are becomes pretty evident pretty quick that in order for all these things to be taken care of and for man to properly exercise dominion, this is going to necessitate more than just two people. So the first answer to why male and female is for the propagation of the human race out of the necessity of obeying the command to be fruitful and multiply and out of necessity of ability to obey the command to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Now, secondly, the reason for male and female, the second reason is found in the next chapter, chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the second answer to why male and female is because God saw that it was not good that man should be alone. This is the only thing that God says of his creation prior to the fall that it is not good, that man is alone. So God in his divine wisdom and knowledge and providence saw fit that, a, that man would need a helper. And so out of man, he creates woman. He gives her to be with the man that together they might propagate the human race as we've already discussed here. Notice before he does this that God marches each of the animals before him. The text doesn't explicitly say this, but at least it seems to be implied, almost as if Adam was running somewhat of an interview process. Okay, cow, no, that's not going to work. Chicken, no, that's a bad idea. Snake, definitely not. You have no idea how bad that's going to go later on down the road, and so on and so on and so forth. The animals simply just were not fit for Adam's helper, no matter their capacity uh, for goodness on any particular level. It was necessary that another like Adam would be formed to be a suitable helper for him. And notice the joy in his response when he sees this helper that is given to him. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You may remember when we were here on our Sunday morning services that this is set aside in the original text almost as if it is a song. As if whenever Adam sees this helper for him, he sings. Again, another indication of the completion within the created order upon the creation of not just man, but of woman as well, of male and female. We would do well to note at this point that it is both male and female that are created in the image of God. It's not man created in the image of God and then woman created in the image of man. Even though she is created from man, still it is said of her, she is likewise created imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. God. So we, we have no room here for any kind of overemphasis on male headship as far as outside of the realm that God gives males headship in the home, in the church, etc. But in the generality of the human race, in general society, we have no place to raise ourselves up over the woman. Man and woman equally created in the image and the likeness of God. So we see these two practical ideas of, of why God created man male and female for the propagation of the human race and for man to have a helper. But there's a bigger reason at play here as well. If we read on in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, Moses writes, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, we know the rest of that story we know it anyway, and we've seen it quite a bit here recently. They're, they're created naked and not ashamed. And then in the very next chapter, shame is going to enter in. 
hurt is going to enter in. False image of self is going to enter in. Fear of God is going to enter in. And all sorts of manner of other kinds of things because of sin is going to enter in. And so immediately after this song is sung, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, you shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And as soon as it is said that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and man and woman were both naked and unashamed, in the very next chapter, all of that bliss, all of that joy is ruined and destroyed by the reality of sin. And so it begs the question, what is the hope for man being created male and female in the image of God? Well, the hope is found whenever Paul picks up the same language later in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. He quotes that passage and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And given the context that he's saying this in, he's talking about how men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, and women are to submit to their husbands the way that the church submits to Christ. And so you would almost expect him here to say, so see, Moses wrote, man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. So hey, husbands and wives, you be one flesh. But that's not what he says. That's not what he says at all. He says, this mystery is profound And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Out the gate in the end of Genesis chapter 2, whenever it is said that man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, we have already in that a preaching of the gospel. That just as it is said of man that he should leave his father and mother, Christ would leave his heavenly father. And he would come for his earthly bride, the church that he might, as Paul says elsewhere in this same letter, present her to God without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. Why created in the image of male and female so that God in eternity past and in time could preach the gospel to us even from the very beginning of Genesis chapter 2? So we see the reason for God creating man, male and female. God created man, male and female after his own Image. This language is picked up from, as where we've already read in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our own image, in the image and likeness of God, let us create him male and female. So why create in the image of God? Well, particularly to exhibit his attributes, namely his attributes of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. If we peek ahead just a little bit, God created man, male, and female after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion, over the creatures. What it means to be created in the image of God, first of all, negatively, has nothing to do with a physical likeness. We need to be clear on this point. It's not that we are the way that we are and we're created in the image of God, so therefore we have a right to think of God like a man. That's not the case at all. The word, as a matter of fact, doesn't even leave room for that kind of an interpretation. Rather, what the word points to here for image of God has more to do with the endued likeness in our inner attributes of who we are. You may recall back from the question of what is God. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. So there we prove our first point that we've already dealt with and don't have to deal with in any further capacity that God is a spirit, not a man. Okay? But God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And we discussed how that infinity and that eternality and that unchangeableness are his incommunicable attributes. They find no analogy in us, the creature. But remember that the next seven do being wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. They find analogy within the creature. So when we say that God created man in his own image, that's actually what we're hinting at. These communicable attributes that have been communicated to and into mankind and in mankind which do indeed find analogy in us, the creature. Now particularly what's singled out here are the attributes of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Why the divines point those out alone, I'm not 100% sure but I have a guess that we'll get to here in just a little bit. So God creates man in his own image, male and female, to exhibit his attributes, namely knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. But further than that, God creates man, male and female, after his own image, that he might manifest his works as well. You will recall that God said in Genesis chapter 1 that mankind was to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the ground, to work it, and to have dominion over it and over everything that is in the created order. You may remember that we've said sometimes in Genesis, and we've even said in recent sermons, that man was put in the garden as an underking, 
as an under ruler, as an under steward over this creation. All of creation still belongs to God. It is his. He is the creator. Nobody can take it from him. But God places man in the garden and sets him as a steward over this creation. And so God creates man in his image to exhibit his attributes, but also to manifest his work. In being told to subdue the earth and have dominion over it, we're being told to be like God in our capacity for our work. To be good stewards of what has been given to us because he is an ultimate good steward of us and of everything that is his. Now, just as with the image of God in male and female, here with the image of God plainly, we are faced with that grim reality once again that we know full well we didn't do that. We know full well that we've wrecked the command to be fruitful and multiply and taken sexuality to all kinds of extremes that actually has no business of going whatsoever. We've marred that. And we've completely ruined what it means to subdue the ground and to work it. In our sin, God put the curse on Adam that the the ground would no longer produce fruit for him the way it did before, but that now it would do so only with work, hard work, by the sweat of his brow, as the old translation puts it. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for him. So God creates man in his image to exhibit his attributes, to manifest his work, but because of sin, that's exactly what we don't do. We don't properly manifest his attributes. We don't properly manifest his work. And so what's our hope? Paul answers that for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He writes, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is the hope? For humanity, having been created in the image of God for the purposes of manifesting his attributes and manifesting his work, but completely and utterly, not only failing at that, but outright rejecting it in their cosmic treason and rebellion that they committed against God and breaking his holy law, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one who is the true image of God. Jesus Christ, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Broken vessels. Broken vessels. Trying to fulfill our purpose. Trying to do all that we can do. But we want to do, we cannot do, and the very thing we don't want to do is exactly what we do. But in these broken vessels, in these jars of clay, these fragile vessels that could break at the slightest little fragment or drop or bump, it is in those that we contain this treasure. This treasure being namely the gospel. That Christ, the true image of God, has left his heavenly dwelling and has come and become flesh on our behalf that he might properly manifest the attributes of God in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, that he might properly exercise dominion over that which God has given to him. The hope for mankind in their fallen nature and their marring of the image of God is found in the face of the glory of Jesus Christ. God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Knowledge should need no explanation. I think the concept of knowledge is is fairly well known, but particularly when we speak of knowledge, we're speaking of knowledge of relation to God, others, and the rest of creation. Let me say that again. When we say knowledge, we're referring particularly to knowledge of our relation to God, others, and the rest of creation. Here's essentially what I mean. Whenever God created man in his image and placed them in the garden... He placed them there with a proper understanding of their relation to him. A proper understanding of who they were as creation and who he was as creator. A proper understanding of what it was that they were to believe about God and a proper understanding of what it was that God required them to do. Is this not exactly what we lost in the fall? 
no longer understanding the proper relation of us as creation to God as creator, no longer properly understanding what it is that we are to believe concerning him, no longer properly understanding what it is that God intends for us to do. And so when we speak of knowledge, this is particularly what we are referring to. And in our fallen state, our knowledge is marred. We, we live in a society where even if you are the uh, quote-unquote dumbest redneck that there ever was, you still have some respect and, and understanding and reverence for the concept of knowledge. Everybody appreciates a smart person, appreciates a person that knows things. But if we're honest, we don't have much appreciation for a smart person who likes to show you just how smart they actually are. And that's exactly what we do with our knowledge whenever we have it. We like to boast ourselves up, speak of how we attained it, how we work to get it. We like to show off exactly how much it is that we know. Whenever I first started preaching and, and, and got a little bit of Greek and Hebrew under my belt, I loved to craft sermons where I could say, now this word in the Greek, and I got a bad habit of saying you know, the Greek word and then say it with me, you know, Greek word, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Every now and then that bad habit still pops out. But I noticed over time that that wasn't so much out of a true understanding of actually wanting people to understand the word of God. I just wanted to show you how much Greek and Hebrew I knew. It was pretty cool. I was impressed with it. You should be impressed too. This is what we do with knowledge. Or we go the other direction. And because we do decide that we are just so dumb and so stupid and can't know anything, we just become utterly lazy. And we cease to, to seek out knowledge. We cease to try to attain knowledge. We cease to try to learn properly our relation to God as creation. He is creator. We seek to try to learn properly what it is that we are to believe concerning God. We cease to try to learn properly what it is that God expects us to do. We are poor, poor, poor stewards of knowledge because of the fall. But again, just as in the last few points, there's good news for us. In Colossians Chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writes this, I'll begin in verse 9. He says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Christ, the one who not only had, but was perfect knowledge of God incarnate. Christ, the only one who understood the proper relation of man as creation and God as creator. He's the one that did it. He is the word eternal. He is the word that declared, let there be light. Christ comes. And in Christ, we, the people of God, are being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator in Christ. Paul picks up on this Language also in Ephesians, where we were earlier, but just a chapter back or so. Chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge." that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The hope is no longer in how much we can learn and how much we can know. The hope is in the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that surpasses all understanding. Left to ourselves, we cannot possibly contain the knowledge of exactly what it is that God has done for us in Christ. Sure, by the work of the Spirit in us, our hearts are regenerate. Absolutely, by the work of the Spirit, we are given the gift of faith. Absolutely, we are, we are made able to repent of our sins and believe the gospel. But do we really know it? Do we really know what it means that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe to the Jew and to the Greek? Do we really know what that means? I would wager to say that we never will, at least in this earthly life that rather whenever we go into glory, we will then finally know as we have been known because of this love that surpasses all knowledge. God created man male and female after his own image and knowledge as well as righteousness and holiness. We lump righteousness and holiness together here because the two are, though distinct, intricately connected. When we speak of righteousness, we speak of an inherent justice in an individual. We speak of a, an appropriated rightness within the person. Just so we're clear, nobody in this room fits that bill. I hate to tell you. Again, because of the fall. But in our original state, we did. We did. 
We could speak of righteousness, particularly righteousness in relation to our will. But when we speak of holiness, we are speaking of the inner person. We're speaking of the purity of an individual. Sometimes instead of holiness, we are speaking of the otherness of that individual. This is typically what we speak of when we speak of God being holy, that he is completely other than everything and everyone else. So we speak of righteousness in relation to our will, and we speak of holiness in relation to our affections. So what this means for us is just this, that whenever God originally created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, man had this knowledge, this righteousness and this holiness purely in the garden. Their righteousness in their will was pure. It was not marred by sin. Righteousness in relation to their will, their will was to do the will of God their creator. Their will was to do what God said to do, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and fill it and have dominion over it. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Take and eat of every other tree that is given to you in the garden. Their will was oriented towards righteousness in this regard. Their affections were oriented towards holiness. They had an inner understanding of the otherness of God that had been endued in them, in God as their creator and them as his creation. They had an understanding of the knowledge, the righteousness, and the holiness that God had endued in and on them. The analogy of his communicable attributes that had found analogy in them as his creation. But again, seeing the pattern here, this is marred by the fall. No longer is our, our, our wills oriented towards righteousness. Our wills are oriented towards anything but righteousness. We've already quoted it in passing, Romans 7. Paul says, I I don't do the very thing I want to do, and I do the very thing that I don't want to do. Our our wills are messed up. Our wiring's off. Something's either disconnected or not connected properly, connected in the wrong place. Something's wrong. Because everything that we want to do is everything we know that we should not do. And everything that we don't want to do is everything that we know we should do. We wake up on Sunday morning and and we have better things to do than worship the Lord. Or on Sunday evenings, we have better things to do than to come back and and worship the Lord. Or, Or when you're having that argument with your spouse and you know you should probably just shut up and walk away, but you've got to prove your point. Or, or, or you know, you know that maybe you should keep talking and, and work it out, but you need a minute. Or whatever it is. Your kids or your grandkids just won't listen and they disobey and you know you should speak graciously and tenderly and loving to them, but man, it feels good to bring the hammer down, doesn't it? When somebody's just finally gotten under your skin in just the right way. It's easy to scroll across that post on social media that puts down an entire group of people with one click of a button and go, I should share that, man, that's good. No, it's not. It's not good. It's sin. It's blaspheming against your neighbor. It is bearing false witness against your neighbor. It is speaking ill of the one who is likewise created in the image of God, much like you. It's not good. It isn't. We have improper views of our work, of our employment, of money, of sex, of cars, of all kinds of things, of the way that we dress, the way that we present ourselves, the way that we wear our hair and our facial hair and whatever else. Worried about appearances, worried about what other people think, and not the way that we should be. Not in a way to actually be kind to our neighbor in the way that we present ourselves. No, 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 no. Because our neighbor needs to know just how good we are. How put together we are. And I could go on and on and on and on. Our will isn't oriented the right way. Our affections aren't oriented the right way. Our will isn't oriented towards righteousness. It's oriented towards unrighteousness. Our affections aren't oriented towards holiness. They're oriented towards damnation and wickedness. But thanks be to God, Paul says, also in Ephesians chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. 
What's the hope for attaining this original righteousness and holiness that we were originally endued with and, and found analogy of God in ourselves in? It's not in ourselves. It's not in fixing all those things I talked about. Okay, I'm not going to share the Facebook post. Okay, I'm going to speak more tenderly to my bride. Okay, I'm going to work things out whenever I know that we need to. Okay, I'm not going to slander my neighbor. Okay, I, I'm going to stop spending my money on stupid stuff. I'm going to stop worrying about money in the first place. I'm going to stop worrying about status. I'm going to stop. I mean, yeah, you can stop doing those things all day long if you want to, but it's futile. Because the reality of the matter is, and you know this, we're in March. Pretty sure everybody's New Year's resolutions are screwed at this point. Let's just go ahead and be honest. You're going right back to it. Like the dog that returns to its vomit, as we said this morning, or the sow that once it is clean returns to the mud. You'll go right back. Left to yourself, there is no hope. There, there, you, there are no bootstraps from which to pull yourself up by. Your bootstraps are broken. What is the hope? Well, the hope is to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, to put on the new self, creator after the likeness of God, and true righteousness and holiness. Well, how do we do that? By our faith. By our faith in Christ. The only one who is the true image of God. The only one who, as we have said, properly exhibited the attributes of God, properly manifested the works of God. The only one who is within himself the perfect knowledge of God. The only one who is within himself the perfect righteousness of God. And the only one who is within himself the perfect holiness of God. And the good news is, he came and he was all those things for you. For you. A brother in this church just recently confessed to me that, you know, I believe the historical truth of what you're saying. I believe that Christ did come and live and die and resurrect and ascend to the right hand of the Father. It's that for you part that I have a problem with. To which my answer is, if it wasn't for you, he wouldn't have done it. How do you know it was for you? Because he did it and you believe it. That's how. If you believe that reality... It is for you. It is for you, Christ, the knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, the image of God for you. God created man, male and female, after his own image and knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. We've already read and referenced time and time again here that in Genesis chapter 1, this is exactly what mankind is told to do. So do the earth and have dominion over it, over all the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And this likewise, along with the, the proper relationship of male and female, along with our knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, our dominion likewise was marred by the fall. Now, the good news is it gets reaffirmed in Genesis chapter 9, verse 2, when God is speaking to Noah. But nevertheless, we learn pretty quickly, if you just keep reading a little bit, that it still just isn't working quite the way that it's supposed to work. We're to have dominion over the creatures, meaning we are to take care of the earth. Not much of a tree hugger myself, but there is indeed a reality at which we should care for the creation around us. We should be concerned about these kinds of things. We can't just brush them off and just say, oh, you know, that's just conspiracy theory. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We should care. We should care about what's being given to us in our hands to steward the earth, the animals, the air, and anything else that is put under your care to steward. We should exercise dominion, but we don't. Just like everything else... Just like the knowledge, the righteousness, the holiness, we don't. We don't do any of these things. The psalmist writes in Psalm 8, I'll read the whole psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There are a few ways we could read this. We could read it man-centeredly. We could read it as simply recounting what it is that we have talking to, what we've been talking about here, that God is majestic, that God is the creator, God has created all these things. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, moon, stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, son of man, that you care for him? We could read this as just simply declaring basic truths about what God has done and where God has put man in the created order. 
that a careful reading of the entirety of the scriptures just doesn't allow us to stop there. The author of the Hebrews, whoever you may think he may be, in chapter 2, says, Therefore we must, must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how, we, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Does that sound familiar? We don't read that psalm in a man-centered way. We read that psalm, as we should all the psalms, by the way, of speaking of Christ. Of speaking of Christ, the man that God was mindful of. The son of man that God indeed did care for. That was willingly made for a little while lower than the angels. Who has indeed been crowned with glory and with honor. And indeed who has had everything put in subjection under his feet. Think dominion. Christ, the only one who can properly exercise his dominion. And notice what it goes on to say there, the second half of verse 8. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. He left nothing outside his, Christ's, control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. The world's all topsy-turvy, right? Going to hell in a handbasket, as we said this morning. Yet he left nothing outside his control, even though we don't see it. But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom... And by whom all things existed in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Do you hear that good news? Do you hear of this Christ? Do you hear of this one who was made for a little while a little lower than the heavenly beings? Do you hear of this one who says of us, my brothers, my sisters, my children, those for whom I came, those with whom I likewise shared in flesh and blood, that I might be a faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiations for their sins, my people. But because he himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When we're tempted to fight amongst our spouses, when we're tempted to have an improper view of our sexual relations to one another, when we are tempted to slander or mistreat the children out of which comes from that loving union, when we are tempted to exhibit negative attributes of knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, whenever we are tempted to exercise our dominion unfaithfully, unrighteously, in an unholy manner, when we are tempted to show ourselves ignorant and foolish instead of knowledgeable, we are tempted to act in unrighteousness instead of righteousness. We are tempted to act in wickedness as opposed to holiness. And when we are tempted to, uh, to completely abdicate our position to exercise dominion or are tempted to over-exercise that dominion and be, be, be mistreating of what it is that has been put under us, let us remember this Christ who also suffered when tempted and who is able to help those who are being tempted. 
Let us go with this exhortation. Therefore, holy brothers. Do you hear that about you? Holy brothers and sisters. You who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you reveal to us in your word not only the truth that you created us in your image, male and female, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creature, but that you also tell us of the bad news that we have left all of that in our treasonous cosmic rebellion against you. And praise be to your name, Father, that you do not leave us there, but that you restore us in our knowledge, in our righteousness, and in our holiness by the person and work of your Son, Jesus Christ our true and better big brother, our true and better mediator, our true and better high priest, our true and better and only Savior and Lord. Father, in all of our efforts to exist in this world as your people in godliness and in holiness, when we find ourselves tempted, when we find ourselves failing, when we find ourselves falling short, help us to look to Christ. Help us to remember that he likewise was tempted. But unlike us, he overcame that temptation and that he did it for us. Help us to look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. We ask this in his name. Amen.